please do let me know and of, and of course we, we won't, OK? So I think we'll start. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Normally I say good morning, but it is the afternoon. Um, I'm Caroline Logan, Bill Force Programme Director. Lovely to see so many of you on the call today. Um, so delighted to have um, HS2 Limited with us today as part of our HS2 series. We have some fantastic speakers lined up, some ex-military who are going to share transitional journeys with you. And then we have some construction experts who are going to impart their valuable knowledge. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm going to stop talking now and just say sit back and enjoy. And I'm going to hand over to our CEO, Angela Forbes. OK, hi there, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Um, welcome to our virtual career chat. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all back as we see lockdown restrictions lifted actually in most parts of the country now. So Scotland joined you all earlier this week. So I hope you are safe and well. Now, we do have an incredible lineup for you today as part of our appointment on HS2 as the military partner. We're running a series of these virtual career chats scheduled over the summer with the major tier one contractors delivering the works and with the labour supply contractors. So we'll hear from all of them. But today is a special treat. So today is HS2 Limited. So this is the company responsible for de developing and promoting the UK's new high speed rail network. Now, as we've said before, the enormity, the innovation and technology, the engineering, the complexity of this project takes it to a whole new level. So be ready to be utterly fascinated by what you're about to hear. But you'll equally be impressed by the number of veterans who form part of this incredible team and who will share their transition with you today and an insight into the role that they have on this remarkable project. So we're going to hear from six speakers today. So a whistle stop tour on the careers, including the land and property director role from Mike Hickson, who's ex RLC Brigadier, Pete Solit with his very unique and fascinating role on client services director. We've got a previous Build Force director, our very own Andy Rhodes, who's head of logistics, and we're delighted he can join us. Shane Gray, Senior Construction Manager, and Ali Southern, Health and Safety Risk Management. So both incredibly talented industry individuals. And then we'll hear from Andy Walker, Project Manager. So without further ado, I will pass over to our first speaker, Mike Hickson, and we'll turn our cameras off, Mike. Angela, thank you very much indeed. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, I'm just going to run through a few um, slides before we start, really to talk about um, HS2 Limited, um, as Angela said in the introduction. Um, but it's really great to be here to be able to talk about HS2 and importantly, uh, as Angela said, about our journeys from the military to where we are now, which is working on Europe's largest infrastructure project. And I particularly want to draw out the opportunities this project presents for ex-service personnel. Now I'm going to introduce the project um, and I'm going to focus on phase one, which runs from London to Birmingham. But we've just received Royal Assent for phase 2A, so there are opportunities in the future as HS2 expands northwards. And then having given you an overview of the project, I'll finish off with a brief, brief outline of uh, how I got here. So um, it was fairly recently that the Prime Minister said that the UK will build back better and build back bolder. And HS2 is a cornerstone of that strategy because the scale of what we're setting out to build is without parallel in the UK or across Europe at the moment. HS2 is Britain's new high speed railway, as you know, and it will be the backbone of our future rail network. We're building over 345 miles of new high speed track that will be integrated into the existing network and our rolling stock will run at speeds of up to 360 kilometres per hour. But the track itself is just the start. HS2 will link eight of our major cities from London and the south of England to Edinburgh and Glasgow and Scotland with faster, more reliable services connecting up to 30 million people, which is around half of the UK's population. In very broad terms, there are two elements to HS2 and Angela outlined it in her introduction. HS2 Limited, which is the client, the arm's length body that's been created to act as the client and the company 
working to the Department of Transport to manage the build. And HS2 Limited is not the company that is physically building the railway. The supply chain is that body, or perhaps I should say bodies, that are the contractors who will physically build the railway. And it's important to understand the difference. HS2 Limited is responsible for getting the legal right to build the railway. It's the company that takes the hybrid bill through Parliament. The company that's responsible for acquiring all the land required for the railway. And it's the company that lets and manages the contracts to the supply chain that will actually build the works. And HS2 Limited is responsible for delivering HS2 to budget and time. And from a jobs perspective, HS2 Limited is approximately 1,500 people. Our supply chain is approximately 30,000 people. As such, there are many more opportunities in the supply chain than in HS2 Limited. Now, HS2 has three phases. And as I said earlier, I'll focus on phase one. But phase 2A consists of 35 miles of new high-speed track, which will run from the West Midlands to Crewe, passing through parts of Staffordshire and Cheshire. And as I said earlier, that's just received Royal Ascent. Phase 2B route will service the north in a Y shape, split in an eastern and a western leg. The western leg will connect to the high speed lines at Crewe and run through to Manchester. And we've recently received instruction from the government to begin preparing the hybrid bill for this section. The eastern leg will connect to high speed lines in the West Midlands and run through to Leeds. And we're playing an active role on the eastern leg, working closely with the National Infrastructure Commission on an integrated rail plan. But at the moment, we have no instruction for phase 2B East. So phase one. Um, phase one means delivering um, a significant amount of work. We're going to divert eight major rivers. We're going to build hundreds of bridges and viaducts. We're creating earthworks for 75 kilometres of cuttings and embankments. We'll need over a million tonnes of steel, over 2,000 cranes, dumpers and tipper trucks, and 10 tunnel boring machines. And we're building three new stations and improving one existing station, two new depots and maintenance sites, and we'll have over 200 construction sites. And this slide just gives you a sense of the scale of phase one of the HS2 undertaking. And as you can see, it's really extensive. Now, I mentioned the supply chain earlier, and the scale of this project means that all of our major contracts for the civils works are being delivered by joint ventures. They're simply too big for one company to take on. Our smallest contract, the Align joint venture, that alone is worth about two and a half to three billion pounds. Now, this slide shows how the phase one route has been allocated to four main joint ventures and the construction companies that are made up um, to make up those joint ventures. Now, if you're looking for a role in the HS2 supply chain, it's these companies that you need to focus on. And I should state here that these are not our only contractors. Prior to the main work civils works taking place, we've conducted significant ground investigations and we're still conducting significant enabling works. And Pete Sollett, who leads our enabling works contracts on, is on this call, so I'll leave him to cover that. However, these enabling works in their own right are significant, both in scale and cost. So HS2 is more than just a railway. It's an investment in Britain's future. And in many respects, it is a once in a generation opportunity to change the face of construction and engineering industries. Construction's now begun and at its peak, HS2 will support over 30,000 jobs, including 2,000 new apprentices. 70% of the jobs will be outside London, and currently there are more than 12,000 people up and down the nation working on High Speed 2, and we've continued working throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So HS2 offers, I think, a unique opportunity to work on the largest infrastructure project in Europe, the project that will underpin the construction and engineering sectors for at least the next 20 years. To design and build HS2, we need a huge range of works, goods and services from businesses of all sizes. And the construction of phase one on its own has already released around 12 billion pounds worth of contracts into the supply chain. And we estimate that this will mean over 400,000 supply chain opportunities 
to deliver the works on the projects. Two thirds of them are likely to be small and medium sized enterprises. And this will provide the wider UK construction industry with much needed certainty against the backdrop of recovery from COVID-19. So that's my brief summary of HS2 Limited and its supply chain. And by its very nature, I'm conscious I've rattled through it. Um, but I'm very happy to pick up any aspects of that in questions. Um, but before I finish and hand over to Pete, I just thought I'd give you a quick run through of how I've got here. So um, my journey, I left nine years ago. Um, as uh, uh, Angela said at the beginning, um, my last job was director of the Royal Logistic Corps. But for my last seven years, I was doing various one star jobs. I was director of the British Forces Post Office. I was ACOS J1, J4 in the permanent joint headquarters. And I also spent a year at the Royal College of Defence Studies. And I had no real idea of what I wanted to do when I left the military. And so I really focused on network building. And that would be my main recommendation to anybody on the call. It was through that network that I got my first job at Fleur. Um, and I was the business development director for them. I led a bid on uh, DNS, not something I was particularly planning on doing when I left the military, um, defense equipment and support for those of you who don't know the acronym. And I also led the bid on uh, the MAGNOX, the UK decommissioning of the nuclear power plants. But then I joined a project called the TCO project, still working for Fleur, but this is the Tengi Chevroil um, expansion of an oil field in Kazakhstan and I was the operational logistics lead for that. So once again, I was pretty comfortable where I was. I wasn't really looking for a new job, but then I was um, through my network directed towards HS2 Limited, where they were looking for a logistics director. And again, it was my network that got me in there and it was my network that got me that particular job. Um, clearly I had to go through an interview. Um, and then since I've been with HS2, I've done a number of jobs I spent three years as a programme director for Area Central, which going back to an earlier slide was the Align and the EKFB area of the phase one route. I've been a programme management office and a programme integration office director. And as Angela said, I have literally um, just started as the interim land and property director. So that is um, that is me. Um, and uh, I think I'll hand back now to the team. Thank you. Mike, that was incredible. Thank you very much. And I'll pass over to, we'll keep questions for the end. If I can pass over to Pete. Can I just confirm, you. Pete, I've stopped sharing. You have? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Alan, are you able to turn your screen off as well? And we'll just hand over to Peter. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can see and hear me. Um, I don't have any slides. I just uh, I thought I would just um, give you a bit of a uh, talk through. Uh, firstly, to introduce myself and talk through my journey from leaving the military to what I do now, and then offer some some personal lessons, probably the things that I I did wrong or lessons that I learned the hard way along the way, and, and hope that would be of, of value to you. Um, I'll start though with my current role. Um, just so you can understand what it is I do now in HS2. And then I'll go back to how I got here. So I am the Client Services Director for HS2, as Mike said. Um, that, that effectively is the role that looks after all of the enabling for phase one of the project. And it comprises four separate elements, all of which are very different. The first is enabling works. Uh, which are three joint venture contracts spanning everywhere from Houston up to Birmingham. And they do a range of things um, from uh, demolitions for buildings in the Houston area through to the clearance of woodlands, uh, species translocation, ecology, archaeology, um, civil construction through highways and others. So a very broad range of activities. And they've been and they're in their fourth year now. Uh, and their role essentially is to clear the way for the main works contractors to start building the permanent assets. Then we have utilities. Wherever there is a major utilities infrastructure in the way of where the high speed rail is going to be built, that has to be diverted. 
So it's everything from um, large overhead lines from national grid through to uh, gas and water mains, pipelines, sewers, uh, the construction of additional substations to provide power to our tunnel boring machines and also for permanent power for the railway, full range of um, uh, utilities assets, which are effectively done by the utility companies on our behalf. Then a thing called on network works, which is basically a odd phrase to describe the work the network rail needs to do to divert their assets to get out of our way. And that could be anything from the, the conventional rail network to modifying existing stations. Uh, and then finally, we have logistics, which I won't go into because we've got Andy Rhodes on the call, so I don't want to steal his thunder, but that comes under me as well. And that that role effectively interfaces with uh, 28 statutory undertaker, that's all the utility companies as well as Network Rail. The three major joint ventures work for about just over five billion pounds. Uh, that is all at the front end of the programme and uh, is obviously key to the critical path for this project and making sure we have our main works contractors ready to go when they start building. So, so that's effectively what I do. Uh, how, how did I get here? Uh, well, I, I I commissioned from Sandhurst into the Royal Logistic Corps in 1993 uh, and then served through till 2014, leaving as a Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and then uh, and then I, I chose to move on and do other things. The uh, which brings me to my my first lesson, which uh, hopefully will be of value to you, which is despite me telling you what my rank was and my core was in the army. No one cares about your rank or your cap badge, except possibly other ex-military. Uh, and so uh, I always struggled to sort of view myself and others through the lens of what they can do rather than what they wore on their, their hat or their sleeve. Uh, so, so don't be put off to, um, certain roles. Um, no one would have thought an ex-RLC person would be doing construction as I am now, and it really doesn't matter. That's the first thing to say. So I then um, I, I, I then uh, had to start looking for another job. Um, and very much like what Mike said, the, the, the lesson about networking is key here because I I started applying for multiple jobs in the traditional way. And I did not get a single thing, not a single interview, didn't get sifted through to anything. And um, uh, uh, I started to get quite nervous and anxious about what the future might hold. So I started to pick up the phone instead and started going on networking events and that sort of thing. Uh, and um, I, I must sort of publicly acknowledge that it was actually Mike who got me um, my first job in the same uh, project that he just described. Uh, with, with Chevron. Um, so I was able to secure a role um, in, uh, in an oil and gas project in, uh, in 2014. Which brings me to my second lesson around networking. And the thing I learned from that is uh, networking is not speed dating. You can't go to people, say, hi, this is me, I, I give me a job and expect something to happen. You have to establish a rapport and a relationship and it has to be meaningful and you, and otherwise you'll, I think you'll struggle. Uh, luckily for me, I'd worked for Mike for a number of years in the army and we had that established relationship and I was able to secure that role through him and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I then, uh, I continued on that project for about 18 months and then um, an opportunity arose for me to join HS2, which I did in 2015. Um, and uh, I, I think, that, that brings me to my third lesson, which is around how you break into uh, the job market. Uh, and I'd say breaking into your first job is really important, but it's not the be all and end all. Uh, and don't panic. It's really important to find the right thing for you. The reason why I say that is even though the Chevron project was, was an excellent role, um, I compromised two red lines that, that, that I promised myself I wouldn't do in order to do it. The first was I, I, I didn't want to be a contractor, but I ended up doing that, uh, being a contractor in that project. And secondly, I didn't want to work away from home. That was one of the reasons why I left the army in the first place, but I ended up weekly commuting. And as a result of that, 
despite the fact that I had um, uh, I'd relieved, I was relieved by the fact that I'd found a job. Um, it, it didn't last long because uh, those two areas that I compromised on uh, just caught up with me and I had to find something that may be more ha happier with my family and myself, which is why I eventually left. So it's really important to uh, think through what you want to do and don't panic because the right thing will come along. Um, I, I joined HS2 as the project director responsible for utilities and logistics. Um, and uh, I, I did that for about a year at the time when we were still procuring main work civils contracts and we were still working out what it is what we were going to do. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as a result of that, I think that comes to my fourth lesson, which was um, I, I didn't really understand what HS2 was. All I knew was uh, what I did, the, did in the army and briefly in the project at Chevron. Uh, and so the lesson was do your homework and consider the, the, what the perspective is from the employer's uh, point of view. Uh, I had to understand what HS2 is and I had to understand what they wanted um, in order to be successful. And I found that quite hard. Uh, but one, once, you, once you understand where you fit in where you're likely to fit in, where your skills and experience match what, what they need, uh, then life gets a lot easier. And it took me a while to, to get used to that. Um, after about a year in HS2, I then moved on to a different job uh, dealing with network rail. Um, and uh, and that, uh, I found that strange because I had no experience of network rail, but it was told, uh, it explained to me that that was a benefit uh, because I would be able to look at it from a fresh perspective uh, without any um, baggage, if you like, um, from what, what may have come before. And we and it's fair to say that we had um, quite a strange relationship as two companies at the time. And my job was to bring it together and make them work uh, more collaboratively together. And you know we, we've managed to do that, uh, which brings me to sort of the lesson I learned from that, which is, the skills that you bring as an ex-service person are, are so important because projects, like anything else, are just about people. And the, and the job I had to do there was get the people working together. What they were working on was almost secondary to the behaviour, the leadership and the cooperation was needed from them. Uh, and, uh, and now they're working in, in a really effective way. Um, I then from that, having done that for about a year and a half, I was pulled out of that job again and I was asked to spend a year designing a, the operating model and the structure for the delivery teams uh, for phase one. And uh, a, couple of, a couple of lessons came from that, actually. The, the first was uh, that so much of the thinking uh, that goes into military doctrine and training and the way that the military operates has such obvious read across to major projects and other areas um, that 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 you should you should tap into what is of value and use it. Use the ideas, but don't use the language because people get put off by military language, but they don't get put off by the ideas because they're common to all. And if you know if you look carefully at how HS2 phase one is operating now. If you've ever worked in the permanent joint headquarters, you'll see a striking resemblance to the operational team const construct. If you looked at the geographical boundaries of the contracts, you'll see a striking resemblance to battle space management. And actually initial operating capability, full operating capability are terms which are used quite frequently within HS2 now. And that is not a coincidence. That was introduced by people like us who've used that, those terms in other areas. So use the ideas, not the language. Uh, and then after that, I've moved into the role that I've, I'm in now, which I've already explained to you, uh, client services director and all of that entails, which leaves me with the final lesson that I've learned in everything that I've done in HS2 and in the Chevron project, which is uh, actually on reflection, major projects are just like military campaigns. It's just the language and the tools that are different, but you have to understand the, the language and the tools that other people are used to are what you need to get accustomed to, but you can still bring ideas and insight and skills and experience that you've hard earned and be of value to them. Uh, and the last thing I'll say before uh, handing over is 
prior to this call, I was on a call with our chief financial officer, uh, who is sort of second to the chief executive officer, and he was formerly acting chief exec of defence equipment and support. And I mentioned to him I was on this call, and he said, "We'll tell all of them that we're looking. We really need good ex-military people uh, on this project because they bring great value." So I wish you all best of luck, and that's all from me. Peter, that was a brilliant closing statement. Thank you for that. Um, and we'll hand over to Andy Rhodes. Andy, we've got a brief glimpse of you there. Are you back? <laughs> yes, uh, but fingers, I'm afraid. Um, I'm a bit worried that I'm about to prove um, the exception that proves the rule to what um, uh, what Pete's just said from the Chief Financial Officer. However, uh, I'll push on anyway. Um, to cover my journey, I always wanted to join the Army. I always wanted to be commissioned into the Army. I went to Sanders like Peter, actually, in 1993, came out, commissioned the RLC, um, went to 23 Pioneer Regiment, and right at that very early stage of my career, I think that's where I sort of cut my leadership teeth, um, went through a fairly standard um, uh, young officer, adjutant, operations officer uh, process, finished up as the Deputy Chief of Staff of 16 Air Assault Brigade, having decided that I was a little bit underwhelmed by logistics. Uh, there's an irony in there somewhere when you find out my, my subsequent role. But finished as 16, uh, Decal 16 Brigade, got home from what was, I think, my, my third tour of, uh, uh, third op Herrick, third tour of Afghanistan, to that sort of um, situation that lots of us have had, I think, which is um, my wife telling me we could either be married or I could be in the army. Uh, and there was a choice for me to make there. Um, on reflection, I probably paused over that decision a little bit too long. However, decided to leave the army, um, but it put me in a, a similar position, I think, to what Mike and, and Peter both described, um, certainly Pete, which is I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was suddenly faced with leaving the army rather than having had a transitional period of deciding what I wanted to do when I left. Um, and I'm not going to weave in my lessons to, to, to what I describe. I'm going to keep them to the end, uh, more because of a lack of intellect than anything else. Um, but there is a key point to that, um, which I think is that given the, my time again, I would have started planning long before and some of you have left some of you are leaving but there is always chance to do a little bit of preparation for that but i left the army nevertheless i went initially to be the head of terminal at stansted airport decided that this was the job i'd always wanted uh, was promptly made redundant um, and then headed off um, to a job as the head of construction logistics at heathrow for the capital build program at heathrow building terminals and, and all that kind of thing um, Again, like the previous people have spoken, network was everything. Um, I wouldn't have got a look in um, had I not had a network um, because I didn't have a construction background. Uh, I'd been uh, an army logistician and I'd run a terminal at Stansted and suddenly they were looking for somebody to run construction logistics at Heathrow. Um, echoing Peter's point, what they really needed was leadership. Um, and um, that is one thing that I think we all uh, perhaps sometimes underestimate uh, in terms of the strength of uh, leadership skills that we get in the army uh, until you leave and then you perhaps see where a lot of those strengths are that you didn't notice before. So then uh, started a construction logistics career, went from Heathrow to the Battersea um, power station uh, development via a couple of um, small sort of uh, other sojourns, um, ran that for just over a year and then um, again, through networks, heard about the opportunity to run um, the logistics uh, for HS2, uh, the client side logistics for HS2, and then came in to this job uh, that I'm in now. And I've been in it since September last year and have the interesting position, um, again, hardly unique, but uh, I've got 30, 27 members of a team. Uh, I've met five of them so far, started seven months ago, and I've still only met five of them because of the COVID um, situation. And of course, there's an element of, of leadership and challenge to that. Um, I complain about how much it impacts me. Actually, I think it probably impacts my team more, but but there we are. What do I do now? Um, my responsibility really is for um, making sure that there is compliance from the logistics um, that the JVs deliver. Mike described how um, it's our contractors that deliver logistics. They come up with the plans. What I do is string those together into strategy and make sure that the plans that they are producing are compliant with what we need. Um, and in big three big chunks, really, of function, uh, one of them is construction logistics. So that activity that happens on site, the big yellow plant, uh, getting people and materials onto and off site uh, and making sure that it's all done efficiently uh, and safely. Um, there's then traffic. Um, for those of you who live anywhere near the uh, HS2 route, 
uh, you'll be acutely aware that actually because of service works, because of construction works, we have to impact the road network. Um, it's unavoidable. But as a result of that, we have at any one time 15, 1600 uh, traffic activities going on which disrupt uh, a road or are putting in new roads or are otherwise affecting um, uh, the road network. And then the final component is transport. And that's making sure that the uh, the large number of um, heavy goods vehicles that are moving around delivering materials, uh, those that haven't already been transitioned into freight rail movements, um, do so safely. Uh, and you'll appreciate that although we use rail wherever we can, there isn't always a suitable railhead or rail line, uh, ironically, that we need. So there's still a lot of transport as well. So that's what I'm responsible for, is making sure all of that is tied together, is delivered efficiently and safely. Now, my sort of five points of learning, um, I'm going to start with a, a sub point, which is we probably should have discussed this between ourselves to say what we were going to say, because uh, on the one hand, there might be some duplication, but hopefully you'll see that as as reinforcement rather than anything else. And I, like the others, can can give you this advice and learning, not only as a former service leaver, but as somebody who has interviewed and recruited service leavers um, uh, since then. And I think my five points start with network. Lots of people have talked about network already. I have too. Um, I would draw one distinction, um, and that that it is absolutely fundamental, but it's very distinct from nepotism. It's not employing people you know for the sake of it. It's people who understand your skill set and what you have done in the past. Now, you don't even need to have worked with somebody to have a network with them. But the the the, the, the key point for me, really, uh, and this is the, the 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 point at which my whole sort of post military life rotated around was actually understanding what network is and what networking is. Because as Pete alluded um, to before, it wasn't about going to somebody and saying, I need a job. Um, and that's how it felt to me. You know, I was 38, 39, leaving the army, never had an interview apart from to go to Sandhurst. Um, and I had it in my head that I was gonna meet these people and tell them that I needed a job. And that was an enormously uncomfortable thing to do. The other enormously com uncomfortable thing to do for me, like many of you, is tell people what I was good at. That wasn't something that I did as an army officer. You, you know, you tend not to uh, talk about your own skills and, and strengths. Um, and I was given a book called What Colour Is Your Parachute? And I read some of that and I got to one section which basically said this is how networking works. And it's a very simple technique, which is to say you're not going asking for a job. You're genuinely and honestly approaching somebody that you may know already or not. And you're saying I'm interested in what you do. I want to do something similar. Can you tell me what it's like to do that job? That's the network. That's the touch point. And from that comes everything else. And once I'd got my head around that, that I wasn't asking for a job, I was asking for advice on how to get into someone else's line of work. The whole thing fell open for me mentally. Um, and I was suddenly able to network and um, to do it effectively. And like certainly uh, Peter, perhaps like Mike as well, um, had I not had a network, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have got any of the jobs that I've got since I left the army. Uh, the network was always at the centre of it. So networking is absolutely everything. And do not think that networking starts when you leave the army or the Air Force or the Navy. It starts way before then. It's not too late to start it afterwards, but actually getting those network connections together. Now, I've laboured that point because it's really important, the most important one for me. The next point is that um, for me, leadership is leadership. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the forces or in industry or wherever else. It doesn't matter. That is, for me our fundamental transferable skill. We get leadership. And the thing that I think that I've brought to um, uh, leadership outside of uh, the army, as it was for me, is context. And so I've been conscious that there have been situations uh, whereby other people around me have been flapping, panicking, not knowing what to do. I've tended to be quite calm. And that to me is context, because once you've had that uh, experience of being on operations or you know where people's lives are, are at risk, actually everything else fits into a different sort of context. And I think that's really important. And also as, as an officer, as, as senior NCOs and, and warrant officers and everyone else around here, junior NCOs too, the, the emphasis on staying calm, isn't it, and making decisions. And I think that's a fundamental lesson that you can carry across. The next point I'll make is about service relevance. You've got a huge amount of relevance from what you bring from the services. Transferable skills we've already talked about, um, leadership. The other thing that played on my mind was I'm 38, and I'm going to go for my first job interview. Didn't matter. The fact that you can actually brief commanders and other senior people and visitors 
is exactly like an interview. You're standing on your own two feet, you're articulating uh, um, a piece of information within a certain amount of time, and I'm probably going over, by the way, which shows how bad I've been at it, but you're de delivering that information uh, to somebody else. That's exactly what an interview is. You're enormously well prepared and far better prepared for an interview than you think you are. And you realise that when you see the other people going in for interviews who perhaps have done many, many more interviews and are not coming from a service background and all the things I've talked about before, you know, about being calm and being prepared and everything else, suddenly you realise that you're in a better place than you thought you were. So there's huge service relevance. There is also huge service irrelevance. And some people cling to it. And if I look at this from um, being somebody who's in, uh, recruited and um, employed people from the army, the thing that switches me off um, as quickly as anything else is when people don't realise that as a employer in a commercial company, actually I'm employing somebody at risk. There is a risk with employing service people. And there are some um, you know, common perceptions about they don't understand commercials. Um, if they're senior officers, for instance, they're not used to do any work for themselves. Other people do it all for them. There are these, these concerns, these stereotypes. And actually, if you come in for an interview with me wearing your parachute regiment tie, your parachute regiment cufflinks, uh, with your shoes highly bulled and everything else, actually, my first thought is you're still harking back to something that you need to have left behind and moved on. And for me, it reinforces those risks. It doesn't remove them. Um, and, and I would say, you know, the, it goes beyond the sort of presentation piece. I was in the Royal Logistic Corps. I assumed that my job would be in logistics. I went and started networking. And the first thing I learned was that the logistics that I had been taught and the logistics that I conducted in the army was almost irrelevant in speciality terms to what I was going to do anywhere else. Because big shock for everyone, but army logistics is even more prehistoric than construction logistics. So that was an irrelevance. And what I realized was that I was an operational person, not a logistics person. I was an operations manager, director, brackets with some experience of logistics, not a logistics director. So there's a lot of service irrelevance to uh, undermine some of the service relevance. Um, but the final point I'll make, and I'll make it very quickly, is, is, is again a point that, that Pete made. You know, the number of times that I've come across problems in commercial um, environments and situations for which there has been a, a service solution is staggering. Things like um, the one third, two third rule, basic things, that how we, we, we manage our soldiers and, and other service people. You only take a third of your time for yourself. Do you know what? That is a fundamental management principle, but it's lost on a lot of people in commercial businesses. And actually just ad adopting that turns things around um, and makes things work. Um, Pete's talked about some other concepts uh, from defence, which, which makes sense. I think the real point is that um, you can't lose any of this. Um, you've got to bring it forward. So when I say, you know, don't wear your regimental tie and don't think hark back to what you've done, I mean that in a, in a way of not alienating yourself. There's so much that you must bring with you because at the end of the day, someone's going to employ you, whether through a network or otherwise. And as, as again, as Pete said, you know, need to find how you fit in. Do you know what, what you're going to do when you fit in is you're going to demonstrate exemplary leadership as among everything else and bring those sort of skills, transferable skills. And a lot of the knowledge that you um, had, which made you successful in the forces, will make you successful in industry as well. And so don't forget it. Just don't ram it down, down people's necks. Otherwise, um, it will undermine your position rather than reinforce it. Um, but also, final positive note, don't stop being proud of what you do. I was telling Pete earlier on today, there was one element of my CV which I was really, really proud of, and so I wouldn't take it off the CV. And everyone that looked at my CV said, that's completely irrelevant. You might be proud of it. It's got no relevance to the job you're trying to do. And there was a right, quite a difficult wrench to get it off my CV, but actually I did and I ended up where I am today. So that was probably one of the key moments. Sorry, I've overrun a bit there, but um, those are my lessons. Thank you for listening. Andy, that, Andy, was, that fantastic. was fantastic. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. And Andy. Shane Gray, are you able to join us? Uh, I, I should be there. Can yeah, you see me? Yeah, you're here. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, uh, so my name's Shane Gray. I'm Senior Construction Manager working for HS2 on Phase 2A. Um, I've been invited here today to talk to you about the role of the construction management function in HS2. Um, so just a bit about myself. Um, I surprised myself today because when I looked back over my 
uh, time working in the construction industry, I'm, I'm fast approaching 30 years. So um, I started in 1992 um, doing comms, uh, comms and fiber installation, what was cable TV and, and, uh, and comms work. So and that's really where I cut my teeth for the first 10 years, working in supervisory roles and site management roles. Um, and after four or five years made up to a, a construction manager and then to a project manager. Um, I then moved into the, the next 10 years of my, my CV, my work. I moved into working for London Underground, um, working on various projects, uh, including comms. That's how I, I, I initially got into the London Underground environment, but soon found myself uh, as a construction project manager for the Piccadilly Circus uh, station refurb, so one of London Underground's flagship stations. Um, lots of uh, really good experience through there, lots of construction, lots of um, customer interface working in um, safety critical environment, you know, railway environment. Um, and uh, moved on from there after three years, still within London Underground, but was, was delivering um, railway construction uh, infrastructure projects so platform lengthening to try to get more space on the stations etc um, new resignaling projects um, a lot of a lot of construction and um, uh, multidisciplinary type projects um, and then my the last 10 years so i've worked in major projects so i, I started off in crossrail uh, Whitechapel station delivered the enabling works. There was some very significant enabling works. There were six um, bridges that needed to be demolished, part of the, the, the station infrastructure um, and had to deliver um, the full site clearance to allow uh, the space for Crossrail um, to build their their shafts. So I say their shafts. I was I was involved in, in the enabling works. Um, and I spent four years at Whitechapel Station delivering all of the site clearance and the um, all of the demolitions and all of the enabling works when um, and we talked about or other people have talked about networking. One of my uh, one of my uh, former colleagues um, had started working at HS2. They needed somebody that, that would provide some constructability um, input into the early designs and uh, prior to um, uh, prior to, to gaining um, Royal Ascent for Euston Station. So I moved into the Euston Station team and uh, supported all of the designs the con through to concept design um for for use of station again lots of strategic thinking peter uh, picked up on it earlier working with network rail clearing the the space for hs2 to to form their part of the station at euston um organizing and um and, and preparing the enabling works contractors to to clear the path so that um uh, what, what's, what's what's happening now is for the main work uh, stations contractor to come in and build a station. So that's my uh, that's my first 30 years of, of construction. Um, I thought I'd give you a role description um, of really what a construction manager does in, um, in HS2 and I'll just read this to you. Uh, so definition construction management within HS2 can be described as the overall planning, organizing, coordination, mobilization and the facilitation of contract operations. Uh, construction management personnel are responsible for working with the enabling, mainwork civils, mainwork stations, rail systems contractors and other third parties to ensure the construction and installation activities are coordinated, delivered safely to program and we we achieve an overall quality product. That's slightly different to what a um, well, it's, it's in some respects it's 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 uh, very different to what a contractor construction manager would ordinarily do. Um, the 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 contractor's construction manager would be responsible for delivering. Uh, an asset or a piece of work and their normal uh, their normal working day would be you know dealing with subcontractor procurement 
they may be responsible, let's say, for a piling package. So they'd, they'd undertake all of that uh, work to procure the correct contractors, subcontractors. They'd plan the delivery of the works. They'd manage the work packages and all of the interfaces on site. Uh, manage a team of what we call black hats, so frontline supervisors that would be responsible for elements of work, um, and they'd they'd be uh, reporting on progress and and issues and change management, etc. That's what the the, the contractors uh, construction manager would do. Us on the other on, on the other hand, we we really have a dual role in construction management. One of delivery management, so we 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 check in and keeping an eye on what the contractors are doing um, as, as Mike said earlier you know they're actually delivering they're responsible for delivering the the, the works we're responsible for ensuring that that's all coordinated uh, to time and budget um, so our, our role is as I say one of delivery management and also of assurance um, we we HS2 employ self-assuring contractors, so our role really is to ensure, is, is to um, undertake a level of assurance to ensure that the contractors are delivering on what they should be delivering against the agreed scope, the, the works information in the contracts, um, and uh, in, terms of, in terms of quality, uh, of, of the of the product that they have been employed to, to provide for HS2. Um, what what RCMs tend to have, what we look for in with, with construction managers in HS2 is that they have a blend of construction management skills. So, you know, understand construction methodology, uh, but also that they have some project management skills because what we what we largely are are project managers. So, you know, all of the normal skills that we'd expect project management uh, personnel to have, so stakeholder and interface management skills. Um, we're very customer face, well, I say customer facing, but public facing. Um, on, we're on the ground, we're doing lots of facilitation, facilitating, lots of coordinating. We're checking on um, the light. We have UNAs and commitments, undertakings and assurances and commitments, things that we've promised that we will do or, or won't do. So we're always checking on the compliance around those those promises. Um, it's a it's a far reaching role, uh, construction management. It's quite difficult to to really pin it down because, as I say, you you've you've one foot in the construction management camp and one foot in the project management camp. So, uh, and as HS2 is a matrix style organization, you know, lots of different touch points. Um, I think that we talk about skills and behaviors. We definitely look for, um, for people that are collaborative by nature and not adversarial. So, you know, 20, 25 years ago, contracts were very adversarial. It was very client contractor. Nowadays, um, with, with uh, joint ventures working together, uh, the client HS2 Limited and the contractors are working together for a common goal. So we, we really do look for that collaborative behaviour. Um, I think we've we've touched on um, routes in uh, there are there are two so if you were to look for for hs2 jobs there are two sites there's the hs2 job site um for 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 people that are looking for entry into hs2 limited and then there's the hs2 supply chain job site as well and there's numerous jobs on there from all of our supply chain partners um so that, that there's some uh, two areas uh, definitely to, to to keep an eye on um and just something we haven't mentioned before is hs2 have a delivery partner called the edp um, and the EDP is made up of Jacobs, Atkins and Senna. And um, I'm not sure of the numbers. Uh, it runs into the hundreds of, of people that are that are working through EDP supporting HS2's delivery model. Um, so again, there's opportunity there uh, as well as HS2 jobs and the supply chain site. So um, I, I mean, I'm happy to, to take questions later on but um i think i'll i'll stop there
That's great. Thank you, Shim. Very insightful. So thank you for that. It's a bit of a breeze through, I'm afraid. but <laughs> No, no, no. It's perfect. It's perfect. Thank you. Um, and Ali Southern, is she able to join us? I am. Hello. Hi, I'm going to Ali. try and put my camera on for everybody. Is that on? It is. That Hello. Is. Hi. I've got a, just a few slides, so I'm going to share my screen if that's OK. Let's hope I choose the right screen. It's whirring. I think, uh, <laughs> it's moments like these when it doesn't work, isn't it? There we are. Can I get some indication that everybody can see that? That's it, yeah. Perfect, you. that's a good start, isn't it? Hello, right. Um, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey um, as to our, how I uh, got into health and safety. Um, because like yourselves, I didn't start out wanting to or, or even uh, thinking about working in health and safety necessarily. And as I go through, I will touch on links into HS2 and how health and safety works here to some degree, but it'll be perhaps a little bit more general. Um, OK, so um, here's a little potted history of me on the left and some corresponding bits and pieces on the right that uh, hopefully you'll find useful about transferable skills and abilities and so on. And I'm going to pull up a few models just so that you can see that there's no um, uh, sort of unknowns really around health and safety. Um, I think from my conversations with Andy previously, he recognises the models instantly. So um, you'll actually be able to see that probably everything that I'm talking about, you've done. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, that was my doorbell, but I'll leave it. There's no one else away from the door, so hopefully they'll just go away. <laughs> it's always at moments like this, isn't it? Right. Um, so where did I begin then? Um, I began in academia. Um, I uh, started out uh, working in a medical school teaching medical students, uh, doing uh, research and development. I worked in around neurophysiology and psychology. Um, so how on earth did I ever get into health and safety? Well, um, I got into health and safety because um, those environments had a crown immunity at that time. And perhaps coming from a military background, you might recognize that term. Um, and then suddenly they didn't have that immunity anymore. And suddenly all the health and safety legislation actually applied. And you can imagine there was a fair bit to do <laughs> to actually get to a good place in uh, those terms. So I got involved at that point. Um, and also I do come um, into health and safety from um, a moral perspective, really. People do come into health and safety from various angles, moral being one of those, in that in that environment, I could see the inexperienced, the young, the medical students, the PhD students and so on. Different perception, a very poor perception of risk, did not realise what risks they were facing and weren't aware of what the control measures were. And to me, um, that was a clear uh, fault, a clear gap, and obviously needed a lot of work. So um, I took a step from there into biotechnology, and that's quite a, a, a specific step, an obvious step. Um, and where I moved to um, was a business that developed um, drugs for uh, pharmaceutical drugs for use in um, uh, disease states. So there was a huge variety of different laboratories um, involved in that research. So we had chemistry, molecular biology, tissue culture, electrophysiology, all these things, lots of ologies. Um, and that actually meant a huge variety of risk. And the reason why I'm telling you this is that a large part of undertaking a health and safety professional role is in deciphering the huge collection of health and safety legislation that exists into uh, usable, meaningful chunks for the organisation in which you work to understand and that's applicable into systems and processes and so on that they can use that then will mean that they are ensuring that the requirements of that legislation are implemented. So the reason why I started off saying where I came from and the direction and the reasons why I do what I do is it's really important to have a backstory, a reason. Uh, what's your driver? Why are you doing this? Why are you going in this direction? I am asked it all the time. You're obviously coming into things from a different direction. Hence, it's a good idea to uh, really know what's driving you, the reasons. Um, I've talked a little bit about the variety of risk 
the translation of uh, the legislation into meaningful chunks. And I thought I'd just quickly throw this risk management diagram up on the screen. And I gather from talking with Andy, it's really uh, recognisable from the things that take place in the military. Obviously, uh, all health and safety legislation requires uh, risk assessment, requires risk management. And really what you're doing is you're identifying your hazards, the things that could cause harm, have the potential to cause harm, what the risks might be and how risky, how severe, how likely those risks are to lead to a problem. And you're doing that in various ways, qualitative, quantitative, however, to really be able to identify the big risks and then focus the organization's attention on controlling those and managing those, reducing those. And you can see on the left hand side there, it's the management system and the associated uh, elements that would be put in place that you'd be uh, involved in developing, depending on where you work, that actually help achieve that. Communication comes in, it's a big important role in being a, a health and safety professional. And then obviously we get the circular processes around the monitoring, the review, the audit, which I'm sure um, all makes sense and uh, you've heard before. So I, um, I'm to see if that will move here, yeah, it's moving. Um, I have worked in a number of industries and you can see that or oh, you might think, well, which ones are construction? Well, actually, construction um, plays a part to a lesser or greater extent in almost anywhere where you might work in a health and safety professional role. So, for instance, in that biotechnology company that I mentioned, um, we actually had a large program of laboratory uh, uh, refurbishment activities, CDM, construction design and management regulations, um, were absolutely required in that instance. That piece of legislation that you may or may not have heard of um, is a central piece of health and safety legislation in the construction industry. And really what it's doing is consolidating, helping to consolidate the um, huge collection of health and safety uh, regulations. And it identifies five key roles with legal duties that need to be performed to ensure health and safety is properly managed in a construction project. So if anyone throws CDM acronym at you, you now know what that stands for. Um, and as I travel through my journey, looking at the detail on the screen in front of you, um, I am taken through um, um, memories of where that's been applicable. I've worked in food processing, agriculture. I've done quite a lot of teaching and training, and I will say that that is a key component as well of being a health and safety professional. Obviously, how, you, how far you get involved in these different elements will depend on the size and the maturity and the type of organisation and the level of the health and safety professional role that you're in. Um, obviously, risk management plays a part in everything that you do. Um, I've worked in high hazard industries, they're the oil and gas, the nuclear and rail. Now, an operating rail um, uh, organisation is somewhat different to HS2. Um, obviously, HS2 actually at this point is a huge construction project. It will be a, a very long um, operational railway, but it's not yet and won't be for a while. But CDM, um, construction, health and safety uh, play a part in all of the industries I've worked in, along with that determination, making sense of all of the other pieces of legislation. So just quickly, um, depending on what kind of organisation you end up working in, um, depends how much time you end up in your role in health and safety playing on the blue side or the pink side of this bow tie. Now this diagram called a bow tie, because apparently it's meant to look like a bow tie, um, is depicting um, hazard release scenarios. So your hazards when they're released, when you're exposed, can cause an incident. To prevent that happening, you do lots of stuff on the blue side. So that's your risk management activities, your risk assessments, putting into place those controls, those teaching elements, et cetera, et cetera. On the pink side, that's your reactive piece. That's your emergency response and incident management. Got to be there. But obviously, if you're spending a lot of your time on the pink side, if an organisation is battling here to try and pull itself back from the worst case scenarios, it's not very mature. It's not really um, actually being able to spend the time 
in the preventative activities that it should. And this gives you a flavour of what I really mean by that. So this is a really well known diagram to depict health and safety cultural maturity. Um, and it's something that in HS2, for instance, um, we obviously utilise um, moving health and safety culture forwards in a maturity, in a mature direction with our contractors is a hugely important part of what we do. So we've got the reactive piece down here, spending a lot of time um, dealing with incidents. When you learn, when you gain information, a huge part of what you do in a health and safety role, you can help that organisation move into the more proactive cultural uh, spaces. So in HS2, um, depending on what stage of the overall project you're in, depends on how involved you get in these various different elements. Obviously, we do have a safety management system, but it always needs updating. Um, people with specialist interests can get involved and help and work on those themselves. Um, but obviously, um, we work with our contractors enormously, and a large part of what our safety professionals do is that interaction, that liaison, working on improving culture, but also ensuring compliance. I hate to use that word. It has to be rather more than, than compliance, um, but ensuring that all of the uh, checks and balances then what's needed is in fact in place and making sure that lessons learned are distributed so finally I'm sorry I am running over moving on to your side again on the black side here on this slide thinking about some of those transferable skills within a health and safety professional role then both within HS2 but also any organization and it's about confidence and effective communication, definitely being able to listen, not just speak. Um, definitely need to be able to listen. I think I heard one of the speakers earlier saying you really need to um, understand what other people's experience is and really um, take them for who and what they are. Really important, really important. Uh, facilitating, coaching, mentoring, often a negotiator as well. <laughs> Um, you've got to be versatile, energetic, enthusiastic. It can be exhausting, but so motivating. And you learn so much yourself. You really do. Got to be a problem solver. You've got to be practical in your approach. The safety solution has got to work. It's got to be practical. It's got to be the simple answer. It really has. You might get involved in strategy. You might not, depending on where the role is. You will get involved in some degree in either using or developing or assisting with development of processes and documentation. Need to be user centered. They've got to be usable. And you will get involved in training. You will get involved in that aspect, which I know is a big part of the military from my conversations with Andy. And obviously you've got to think about that engagement, that interaction, and making sure that learning modalities are considered in what you develop. Um, so that is a whistle stop tour. And obviously I will see you in questions and uh, hopefully that's helped you, first of all, want to be a health and safety professional, um, but also see that your skills really can be applied in this area. Thank you. Ali, it really did. You sold it. Thank you for that. And again, just showing us that you can transition from any other sector is fantastic. It's music to everybody's ears this morning, um, or this afternoon, rather. Um, Andy Walker, if you're there, our final speaker. Hi, Andy. I can't quite hear you, but I can see your screen. Sorry, can I, uh, have I come that's off it. mute? Yes. Yeah, that's you. Anyway, excellent, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I say, Andy Walker, I'm currently a project manager on phase 2A of HS2. Um, today, uh, ex-military, but I've been asked to cover um, my transition to a civilian role. Um, why choose the construction industry? Why specifically choose HS2 or the wider project? Um, and then just, just for my own benefit, just point you in the direction of some resources that might help in your transition. And then we'll move on to the Q&A. Um, firstly, I've got a um, confession to make. I'm only and was only ever a reservist, um, but stupidly, um, I left university, got a reserves commission and pretty much did full time reserves um, for a lot of years um, and didn't start a real job or real career. Um, so just on the left there, just a bit of an introduction to the background, a couple of tours of Telic, 
Um, FTRS is a company too, I see, and a rifle company. That's a, um, Germany, Cyprus, um, then on to Herrick 10, moving into 11. Uh, another FTRS um, in an SO3 role. Um, and then I signed up for the long language course uh, to study Dari, um, which basically got me two more mobilizations. One I wanted and the second I didn't because I took a year out um, self-employed to um, renovate some houses and sort of rent out slash sell. Um, when I was just finishing the last one, I got an unwelcome call that I had a bit of a call back but based on the language course and I was being sent uh, back to Kabul uh, following that Christmas. Um, at that time, same again, probably like Andy Rhodes mentioned, it, marriage, kids, small family, and it was a choice between the military or settling down in civilian life. Um, I was thinking, right, when I get back from Kabul, again, it was a civilian job and you know, that'll, be, that'll be great. Um, in the meantime, I was looking to do some reserves as a bit of a safety blanket while I look for jobs um, and transitioned into a civilian role. Um, just on the right-hand side there, just a bit of my history in HS2. You'll obviously realise I transitioned into HS2 February 2018. I've done a few roles in the business in the three and a bit years now. I started as an interface manager, which is basically interfacing, interfacing between parts of HS2, its supply chain, uh, stakeholders, you know, farmers, etc., um, and managing um, things like undertaking assurances, which I think HS2 is committed to um, in delivering the project. Uh, moved on to a business manager, which is uh, shorthand, is very easy to say. It's like an adjutant type role, uh, probably adjutant minus. Things like workforce planning, uh, again, linking to other parts of the business, look at some business change, maybe some business improvement, um, budget and forecasting type things. So very much a sort of G1 type um, role. Um, in the meantime, I was also a delivery manager informally, which was I was given small projects to manage um, some business improvements from creating new processes just to streamline things that were going on in HS2 at the time. Relatively short lived, um, as I went back to being a business manager um, briefly, and then again moving on to project manager, which is as you can expect, it's managing contracts, project managing the, um, uh, whatever is required within your part of HS2 or your supply chain, but in my case, it's project managing the design and delivery partner that we're bringing on to help HS2 deliver um, phase 2 here, um, along with usual business as usual activities, monthly reporting, etc. Um, so pretty much bog standard project manager. Um, you've heard from uh, lots of different disciplines within HS2 today. Um, should, that should have given you a bit of a feel um, about the wide range of roles and functions within the business. Um, but I'm going to move on to my transition. Um, arguably, mine is basically how not to do it. Um, I personally look back, I badly planned it. I didn't really have a clear plan. I really wasn't researching what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, what industry I wanted to be in. Um, I was jumping around any roles, looking at whether I thought I could do it or not, reading uh, job descriptions, going, oh, well, my time in X could possibly be that. Uh, literally applying for any any anything and everything. It was a very very reactive time for me, um, echoing well, a lot of the people who've already spoken today. There's lots of rejections, lots of applications uh, filled out without hearing anything back from the company, um, and no interviews. And I was I was certain, you know, I think if I've got a couple of interviews, I'd be quite in, in with a good chance of getting a role, um, but just wasn't getting through that sift. Um, and additionally, because sorry, because I wasn't getting through the safe and because I was jumping about lots of different industries and roles, um, I hadn't really settled on anyone in particular and I wasn't learning much about the industries. So I wasn't crafting my CV to focus on aspects of the industry that an employer might be wanting to see evidence of. Um, and so because of that, as I said, I really wasn't getting much um, traction on all of these applications I was sending out. Um, I sort of put the sights set a bit too high. I think at some points I was looking at roles I probably on reflection wasn't quite ready for, even with the military background. Um, I was comparing myself to peers who'd been out a few years, uh, who'd seemed to be leapfrogging all over the place, um, doing extremely well. Um, and what I hadn't realised is just getting that first foot in the door is probably the most difficult part of a transition. Um, so realign my um, expectations, what I was really bringing to any role I was applying for, um, 
was ultimately um, successful. But one of, one of the big things I want to draw out there is my CV was atrocious. It was full of honking army chat. Um, I thought I'd demilitarised it quite well, but the amount of friends and um, prospective employers who read it and just didn't understand it wasn't relevant to the role they were looking for. And obviously that would have played a large part in getting sifted out for a lot of the applications I made. Um, so ultimately, um, it was just before Christmas 17, I had an interview with HSBC, um, Global IT Department, uh, to be an IT project manager. Um, it was great, got an interview, the interview went really well, um, found out within about half an hour of walking out the door that they'd like to offer me a job. Um, then a sort of crisis hit, did I really want to be that for the rest of my life? Is, is that what I was going to be an IT project manager? And I'm not putting down IT project managers, but I don't think the sort of technicality of that would have been applicable to, to me really. So I was a bit despondent and funnily enough, uh, an old military friend rang up, um, find out where I was, what I was doing, and said, oh, it looks like after Christmas I'm going to be an IT project manager. Um, and basically said, well, why don't you look at my place? There's this thing called HS2, and I, was like, I didn't really know anything about HS2 at the time. Um, and so obviously point me in the direction of the, the the uh, jobs portal, so the interface manager job, so yeah, I could do that. But it was it was the network, and same again, drawing out the theme of today, it was, it was that network and it was that leaning on others' expertise and, you know, picking their brains that helped me decide that, oh, I want to be in the construction industry, I want to do that, that's a good start for Tim, um, and push myself towards that. I was lucky that um, the line manager who interviewed me for HS2 ultimately was um, ex-artillery and he could uh, decode my CV. Um, we won't hold the fact that artillery against him, but um, in essence, it was the person who gave me a, a chance at a job in HS2 because he could see some of the skills I bring from the military into HS2 because of, of course, his uh, military background. Um, I guess from that, sort of how not to do it, lessons learned, I'd say stay calm. There were, there were times I was pretty despondent, you're not hearing back, you know, the HR departments don't tend to be polite and decline you nowadays. Um, don't let the rejections get you down. Persevere, obviously keep trying. Um, my biggest takeaway obviously is demilitarize your CV, really put some time in to learn the language of the industry you're trying to get into um, and figure out how you can use those words versus what you would normally put in a military style CV. Um, I'd say that's one of the biggest things I've taken away in all honesty. Um, and keep an open mind. Um, you, you don't know where you'll end up and you don't know what opportunity um, is going to come your way. So be prepared to be flexible and choose things that you might not necessarily originally chosen. So that's a bit about my tradition, my uh, transition and um, why should people look into the construction industry and or project management? Um, firstly, I think one of the things going back to the IT project manager was uh, IT is very fleeting. You know, something's going to come along in the next year and replace it. And so work you might put on might not last that long. And the appeal for me for the constru construction industry was that you deliver something, you leave a legacy, you build something. There is something at the end of the day that you've had a hand in. Um, which gives you that sense of satisfaction. I think that was one of the biggest drivers for me in, in getting into construction. Um, it's a robust industry, it genuinely is. You know, you have to work to um, tight deadlines, you need to deliver on time, you need to deliver on budget, to quality, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously staying safe 100% throughout. Um, but because of that, because it's a bit more robust than say some other industries, it's for me, the delivery side of the construction industry is very has a lot of military parallels. It tends to have uh, just do it attitude. Let, let's get it done. We're all pulling in the you know, same direction, all those cliches. Um, it just felt it helped ease my transition into a civilian workplace. Um, same again, it's task focused. Uh, you could be um, you know, working on several tasks or small projects. And very, very soon you switch to something else. Um, same again, very much like the military. Um, processes and procedures, I think you've probably picked up from a lot of the speakers today that a lot of things that are second nature to you in the military, you'll find are just the same on in civilian street, um, but just have different names, different terminology, um, and I certainly helped my transition um, into the industry. Going back to the construction industry again, um, it's global, obviously. Um, the mega project industry 
so it's things like HS2, uh, you know, massive hotels in Dubai, uh, except pipelines, etc. Truly global, and we in HS2 work with um, people from all over the world who've had experience on all of these, you know, famous landmarks, buildings, etc. And it, it really is it really is quite rewarding to work in that kind of environment with those these kind of professionals. Um, Demand, I've put an exclamation mark there, is obviously I was quite pleased that uh, there, there was a job offer for me in the construction industry, but I'm obviously talking about, um, for instance, what, once HS2 gets underway, phase 2A, phase 2B, the demand for uh, personnel in all sorts of functions and disciplines across the project, whether that's in HS2 Limited itself or the wider supply chain, is going to skyrocket. Um, so I definitely recommend keeping an eye on the construction industry to um everyone on the call um that is it for construction management so why hs2 um or hs2 limited or the wider project um first off it's not just hs2 it's, it's 1800 people in hs2 itself as the client side but as you've already heard at the beginning from mike's introduction you know tens of thousands of people will be working on this project at its peak um, so you might be working on HS2, but for one of the supply companies. Um, so I, you know, so I'd still recommend that. I say all the points are relatively pertinent to the client and the contract side. Um, I've got diverse stakeholders in there, and in, in essence, given the size of it, you could be dealing with, you know, the supply chain. You could be just dealing with. Um, Obviously, governmental departments, DFT, etc., right down to a person who owns a small, small holding uh, on the edge of the route that you're possessing, and, and you know, effect, ultimately affecting their life. It's so diverse um, that it's very rewarding. No day is is the same. Simply put, one day you could be you know, arguing about a compensation event for something very small, fry, you know, eight hundred pounds or something. Or you know, the next day, negotiating with a multimillionaire landowner who is selling you mineral rights, for example. Um, that diver that diversity of stakeholders and people that you deal with, and all the problems and the complexity of the mega project, um, really does make working in H2 quite rewarding. Um, obviously, I put there. Uh, mega infrastructure project touched on the variety and complexity, but just drawing out um, on the complexity, we have everything in HS2 from you know, ecologists, um, archaeologists, utilities experts, logisticians, as we've already heard, traffic and transport, so many different parts of the organisation. And because of that complexity, you could be making a lot of, a lot of your decisions could be having um, massive impacts on wider functions and disciplines and so that's it's very fulfilling to have that responsibility in my opinion um, and obviously the scale it's huge you saw some of the stats from Mike's presentation earlier on um, this is Europe's largest infrastructure project at the moment there's nothing bigger there's no bigger game ish game show in town in, in my view going back to that task focused um, and the complexity and of the variety etc every day is different you could be just wrapping up one task it's taking a week or so to do you've got the next one on the horizon along with your, your business as usual um, as, as well as you know your overall goal of how all of these tasks and roles and jobs fit into uh, achieving whichever project you're working on within the HS2 project um, so for me very fulfilling I think one of the one thing one thing i really want to draw out is how transformative hs2 is going to be and the project legacy that's going to be left behind um i think it people working in hs2 would be quite easy to be evangelical about it but um it is going to transform the country it's going to it's going to free up you know, um, road space for lorries etc it's going to have a massive impact on the economy and fundamentally how people you know get to work get home um, where they work and where they live. Um, there's huge benefits that HS2 is going to bring. But also in that, um, HS2 has got a vision to be transformative within the construction industry. Um, it is setting higher and better standards in a lot of areas such as health and safety, environmental conservation, um, and just general civils on how we do it, how we report it, um, and how, how we measure that, that success. Um, so just on that transformative legacy alone, I'm quite happy to work here for many a year yet. And I fully expect to be you know, a boring old granddad 
telling my grandchildren all the HS2 stories as well, sat on an HS2 train zipping down the country, uh, which is, same again, really fulfilling. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to echo again some of, some of the um, themes that have come out this afternoon um, about the benefits military service personnel can bring to civilian companies. Um, and I've used this report a few times. In fact, I, I read it when I was, when I was uh, looking for roles myself. And um, it's a Deloitte report, I think, came out around about 2016. And it was it painted the military and specifically uh, service veterans getting into civilian um, companies in a very positive light. And I just wanted to finish on a few uh, statistics um, on that. So as you can see there, 91% of employers with veteran recruitment programs would definitely recommend them. That's pretty much a great uh, endorsement. Um, you can see there some of, some of the things that military service personnel are respected for. Um, but one of the key things is we don't just tend to do our jobs, we add value. The military's left a deep groove in all of us, I believe. Um, one of the greatest ones is obviously teamwork. We've heard, heard already that you know projects are very much about people um, and military, military personnel quite happily fit into that environment. And as well as one thing that's not really talked about a lot, I don't believe, is loyalty. I think that goes, goes without saying, if, if you think back to your regiments, etc. Um, you have a loyalty to the team, obviously to the um, to the cause or the task team or whatever you're working on. Um, and it's even echoed by a lot of the companies, 40% they're saying they're more loyal than their own civilian counterparts, just because I think it's intrinsic to being in the military and that doesn't go away once you transition. Um, the link is on, on the bottom there if, if anyone's interested in the report. Um, I would recommend it even if it just gives you an idea of types of language to use in a CV compared to what the sort of military equivalent is. There's a resource in its own right there, but hopefully if you ever need a little bit of a pep talk, pick me, pick me up, uh, having a read of that would, would actually I'd recommend it. Um, other than that, um, I keep this on because we tend to get a, a lot of interest uh, in HS2 from ex-militaries. Um, unfortunately, it's very much a traditional uh, selection process with HS2. We don't sit, hold CVs. Um, we post them on our jobs portals and through the brokerage site, etc. Uh, CVs go into there, go into a big sift, and then um, obviously people are called for interview. Um, but there's obviously things like Bill Force that you can use to support. Um, we get um, CVs from Build Force on a fairly regular basis, looking for mentorship or critique of CVs, etc. Um, we tend to move past them around the network where people volunteer their time to speak to uh, service leaders who are looking to potentially move into the industry. Um, so that's a resource we quite happily help. Um, and if you were successful on landing an interview with HS2, um, and you felt as if you needed some help, the HS2 Armed Forces Support Network offers some support pre-interview. Obviously, we don't give you the questions or anything like that, but it gives you a bit more background into HS2, um, the way the company works and so on and so forth, just to make you feel, give you a bit more confidence for, for that interview, which obviously um, could lead on to the rule. Um, I've left it on there, work placement, brackets very ad hoc. Um, there are, you know, very rare opportunities to do short work placements with HS2, give you a feel for the business and or the industry. Um, but they're very time intensive to set up and so on, so we don't regularly offer them, um, but they can be if anyone had a great interest and uh, desire to not be paid for however long the work placement is. Um, but any, if any of that's interesting to you, um, feel free to ask a question at the end, um, or if not, you can always email that um, uh, the HS2 and Armed uh, Arm Forces Support Network at HS2 um, and I'm sure we'll be able to help and that is all from me thank you. Andy that was fantastic thank you very much um, we've just got time for some questions so if the speakers want to put their cameras back on um, again if anybody listening does have a question just raise your hand or, or type it in the box and we'll get to it um, in the meantime I'll kick off with some questions I have um, but feel free to, to join in. So the first question then for Mike, and again, thank you to everybody. That was absolutely incredible. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want that to go unsaid. But first question for me to Mike, um, and it was a conversation I was having with Joe Lee this morning, actually. 
when you were transitioning out and you knew you were leaving, what sectors or roles were you toying with? What were your initial thoughts as you were starting that transition process? I mean, Angela, as I said in my uh, my pitch, um, I really didn't know. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had left the army after a three year short service commission and went into sales um, and hated it and then rejoined the army. So I worked out it wasn't sales. Um, I also decided I didn't want to particularly be selling or working back into the military. And yet I joined Fleur and, en Fleur and ended up working into the industry, into DENS. So in, in many respects, I had no idea. And I think that was the thing that perhaps was actually quite advantageous because it opened up all sorts of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I really had a conversation with my network about where could I be useful and actually in all sorts of places. And therefore, I didn't narrow it down. And do you think the Fleur experience helped you with the H secure the HS2 role? Or do you think your military experience that is the bedrock, the foundation of your C that, that helped you with the HS2? I mean, I, I, one of the things I've sort of found is, and it's not a general rule, but I think it happens a lot. A lot of ex-military move out and do a job for a couple of years, maybe two to three years. And they need to almost set themselves out and work out what they're worth, where they can go and get some experience. Fleur was that two to three years for me. And then I um, went into HS2. The background and what Fleur gave me, plus my military, was what got me into HS2. OK, no, perfect. And a, a question to, to Pete. You mentioned a challenging part of the role was, um, or a function of the role was to get people to work together. But what did you personally find most challenging? on your role? Um, you mean from, from when I transitioned out of the military into it, what I'm doing now? Yeah, just in your HS2 role. What, what, because obviously you've got such an eclectic um, military career. So it's almost as if you could, in industry, we could throw anything at you and you, you'll take it in your strides. But what do you find challenging? Where did you have to upskill? Yeah, so, um, well, I mentioned when I spoke that in a lot there are a lot of similarities between a, a major project and what we do in the military. It, it's just about learning the language and learning the tools and techniques. So, uh, for example, I did a lot of the jobs I did in the military, in the joint environment and in the army were related to campaign planning, uh, where we would use all the normal decision support tools and um, uh, and planning and decision making activity you'd normally expect um, uh, and that seemed second nature to me uh, but then I had to learn a whole new different suite of tools and techniques which effectively sought to achieve the same outcome whether that was uh, scheduling, estimating, uh, procurement, contract management uh, you know, Ali mentioned uh, CDM, which is a vital regulation for our industry. I had to learn all about that uh, and other things. Uh, and initially, it was very daunting. I, I thought I was starting from nothing, and this was an alien environment that I was really having to work hard to catch up on. But the more I got to understand it, the more it seemed clear to me that all the ideas, all the concepts are the same. It's just the language and the tools that are different. For example, um, I, you know, I, I came from the, the world in the army of, sort of um, effects based operations, understanding what effects you wanted to achieve, what the outcomes were and how you manage the risks. That is the basis of the NEC suite of contracts that we use in construction. It's exactly the same. It's just the language that's different. It just took me a while to work that out. OK, and a question to um, Shane Gray and Andy might be able to help. We have a lot of candidates that come to us to say, I'm thinking about moving into construction management or project management. Um, what advice would you give or how would you differentiate the roles for someone? Uh, well, I think Andy picked, picked up, um, you know, if you've got an idea about what you actually want to, to, to do in terms of a role, is make sure that your CV uh, brings out all of the uh, pertinent points, if you like, all of your skills and knowledge and experience, uh, because it's, uh, that's what gets you through the SIF. That's what gets, you know, we, we get hundreds of, I say hundreds, we get tens of CVs for individual roles. And, and the, when we do the initial SIF, it's about 
experience, knowledge, skills, etc. So you must make sure that you hit all of those uh, salient points on your CV. Um, I, I don't know, Andy. I mean, you've you've recruited, so what would you add to that? Yeah, I, I, I do agree. Uh, knowledge, skills, experience, etc. Um, I think for the military cohort, uh, go back again is, is demilitarize your CV, make it fit for purpose for the role you're going for. Um, what I found particularly helpful was just doing an entry level qualification, uh, Prince II um, practitioner, which was was quite an eye opener for me because same, as we said throughout, it's the same um, ideas and concepts, which is different terminology. Um, and that allowed me to more narrowly shape my CV towards project management, I think, because um, I could then speak about projects I've done in the military, but in sort of project management terms in the civilian civilian space, which I think sort of helped me break down those barriers and I'd recommend it to everyone. And just on that then, um, Andy, you mentioned about either civilizing your CV or demilitarizing your CV. When you got to interview, did you find that employers were just fascinated by your military experience and took you straight back there or were you having to continue with this translation piece? I had to continue with the translation piece, in all honesty. Uh, yes, the sort of ex-military lends you a little bit of spice, potentially makes you a little bit more in oh, interesting is the wrong word, but do, do you know it breaks down those barriers in the interview when you only have an hour or so to impress. Um, but you have to be able to talk confidently in the terminology and the language that obviously the people who are interviewing you are expecting and would expect from a normal civilian candidate. OK, no, thank you. And a question for Ali. What is the, the greatest benefit of working with all this, all these military types and your greatest bugbear? What would that be? <laughs> oh, I, I can see some of my colleagues on the screen, direct colleagues right now, and they're going, oh, what's she going to say? The advantages, um, very organised, very hard working, very focused, goal orientated, that sort of approach, definitely. Maybe a tad rule based and in health and safety, you've got to be risk-based a little bit more and, and be flexible in that sense perhaps a bit more. Um, bugbears. Um, um, I, I guess when military terminology comes out I get completely lost. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. Um, and, and I find this reverence uh, to um, rank um, a, a bizarre concept. I know somebody mentioned this earlier. Somebody said it doesn't mean anything to civvies um, but it means something to those who used to be in the military. And I've seen some behaviours that are quite surprising in in that sense, which you you just don't understand, in, really. <laughs> I think that's about the best answer. That's about the best one. So they don't talk when you're late for a meeting or anything like that. They're, <laughs> they're polite and courteous. <laughs> Um, they know what they'd get back in return if they did. Good for you, Ali. Good for you. Um, we've got a question from um, Mr Armstrong, I believe. Hi, Russell. Hi, Angela. Hi, all. And everyone who knows me from before, those that don't know me, uh, my name is Russell Armstrong, former HS2 employee, uh, founding member of the Armed Forces Veterans Support Network. Uh, I hand it over to Andy, and he, I can see he's taking it on leaps and bounds. Um, I can only echo everything that everyone has said in this chat about HS2 um, and about the way that they are embracing uh, employing uh, veterans and service leavers. Um, I have a few of my own uh, words of advice and wisdom I can give to anyone on the chat who's looking to come into it. Um, from my own transition, I would come out on redundancy. I didn't know what I was going into. Uh, I had no formal qualifications to back up my experience. Uh, and so I struggled greatly to find where I fit within the civilian world. Um, and I fell into HS2 by accident. Uh, and I knew nothing of HS2 until I got the invitation for the interview. Uh, and then I did a massive brush up on the history of HS2 and dazzled them with the timeline of the, the hybrid build process. I think that's probably what got me the job. Um, ultimately, though, I think my, that's, that leads me on to my first piece of advice is, and it's already been said by others, is make sure you brush up on the com company that you're going into, understand what their aims, what their goals, what they plan to achieve. Okay, and then find out where you your skills and achievements 
and your abilities can help them to achieve those because ultimately an employer will want to know what it is you can bring to the table that's going to help them to achieve the goals that they want to achieve so that's my first big piece of advice second bit as well okay and we've heard a lot from a lot of ex officers uh, amongst us uh, today um, I'm an ex junior NCO um, so I will say this to anyone who's a junior NCO or an NCO of any kind okay it's not an officer sport construction or transition isn't everybody's fault and and it's quite rightly been pointed out your rank or your previous rank means absolutely diddly squat um it's it's what you can give to the company as i've said um i as a as a formal corporal set up the network i had a brigadier coming to me for advice uh and asking you know how we do things and i was giving him direction uh, on how we and how we develop the network um ultimately it, it doesn't matter about what your rank is is what you can do um which is all fantastic news i transitioned out i found that hs2 was no longer for me and i found my dream job which i'm now doing uh, unfortunately it's not in the construction sector um, however, I will wholeheartedly recommend it, the construction industry to anybody. Uh, it, there's a lot of diverse opportunities there. It's not just hard hats and dirty boots. Okay, uh, for those that like to wear something smart, suit and tie, there's lots of jobs in that area. There's lots of jobs where you can get customer facing, customer focus. There's a lot of background stuff as well, but there's also design, there's development, there's IT, there's HR, there's finance, you name it. There's all kinds of roles within HS2, okay? And uh, mostly, uh, as been said, within the supply chain. Um, I've made a lot of good friends, a lot of uh, useful people on my network come from the HS2 area. And the biggest one I'll say, and, I would, and she's gonna hate me for saying this, Okay, Caroline, you are an absolute inspiration. Okay, and you need to carry on doing what you're doing. Uh, and it's with, without your help and support, I don't think the alliance between HS2 and Build Force could have got off the ground. So good luck, everybody. I'm going to have to shoot off because uh, I've got a shift in the morning. Uh, so, but good luck, everybody. And I hope you all the success uh, within the construction sector. Russell, Thanks. thank you very much for that. We appreciate that. And again, we, we echo your points. Caroline leads on our HS2 relationship and we're absolutely thrilled to bits that it is what it is and it is because of her. We'll take one last question and then we'll we'll close because I, I know that we've run over, but Dell Trainer has a, a final question. Hi, Dell. Hi, yes. Uh, um, just a, re a really quick one. Um, I'm so pretty the same as, uh, much the same as everybody else here with the a wise bit of experience, but uh, I need to civilianize my qualifications um so uh prince two or amp or which one do i go for um I've, I've asked a few times um and i get a varied answer but in this particular circumstance which one or both uh probably the answer for me is both prince two to start <laughs> off with apm amp is is a bit harder and longer so you could start potentially start the um the course and look to finish it later on but prince two practitioner will definitely give you a good grounding does that help there? There is, there is AP, okay. APMP uh, practitioner, which is APMP, so that, that's also available. But I, I don't think it really matters. They're both, um, you know, project management um, uh, courses that give you that that foundation um, I, I, either. I'm, I'm, I'm mapping, but I have done um, prints in the past many years ago. So they're, they're, they're both equally uh, as, as good as each other. Thank you, Shane. No, we agree. And thank you for the question, Dale. Well, listen, we have overrun by 10 minutes. So apologies if everybody's tussing at me, but um, I thought it was worth asking the questions and listening to, to everybody's presentations. So I'll pass over to Caroline to close, but thank you again to our speakers. Okay. So I'd just like to echo those thanks. Thank you to HS2. Really, really good mixture of ex military and construction experts, as always, pulled it out of the bag.
And I'd just like to re reiterate, it, it is said week after week in all of our virtual career chats, it is about networking. And thank you, Russell. Um, but And that's how Bill Force can help. We open um, a door to a rich networking platform. We are linked to all the uh, supply chain, as was mentioned, and we are the military broker on HS2. So please do get in touch if you want to know more. Um, we're, we're over running. So just quickly to say our next event, virtual career chat, is on health and safety with Alliance partners Kia and Clancy Group on the 13th of May. So have a lovely evening. I'm now going to be soccer mum. It's going to be cold, so I'm going to go and put my winter <laughs> woolies on. So thank you all um, and have a lovely evening. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.